everyone. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Box, hashtag influencer. I'm your host, Sherry Langford, also the founder of Babblebox. We are an influencer marketing agency. And today's episode is going to blow you away. If you're like me, and for those of you who know me, I am obsessed with cotton candy. And that's what Emily Harpel has done. She has taken a cotton candy business that had to shut down, down during COVID and turned it into the most phenomenal business all on TikTok. So how do you go from influencer to entrepreneur and vice versa on TikTok? We are going to dive into the details today with Emily, and we are super excited. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you here. Please tell us who you are, where you're from. I think you're in Ohio somewhere. So, And what is Art of Sucre? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And the being in Ohio part is spot on, which is so funny because people get really confused when they find out that our brand is from the Midwest. They automatically always think one of the coasts, New York or L.A., but that's I love Ohio. Me too. It gets a lot of hate, but I do live here intentionally. Promise. (laughs) But yeah, I own Art of Sucre, which is a luxury cotton candy company. We used to do events and we've since transitioned into the world of CPG where we ship our cotton candy and our cotton candy glitter bombs quite literally all over the world. Okay, so we need to take a step back. So I bought a cotton candy machine. It is the best investment I ever made. So you were working at events and then COVID happened and events and you were just like, what am I going to do now? How on earth did you go from like literally physically spinning cotton candy and handing them to 12 year olds or wedding guests and then packaging and making that formula and figuring that out? What's so ironic about all of this and where we are now is that for years and years and years when I did events, people asked me like, oh, is your plan to package this? Like, do you ever want to open an in-person store or an online store? And my answer is always like vehemently, no, I will never package cotton candy. I'm never going that route. And now I just have to really laugh at myself because how naive here we are today. Um, but yeah, it really just kind of became this light bulb moment in the event space during COVID. We were told, you know, two weeks and then it was four weeks and then it had been a couple of months. Four months. Of like, oh boy, like what, what do we do now? And so I always tease that, um, my kind of the next thought process was maybe I should go get a real job. So, you know, maybe I should not just spin cotton candy for a living and figure something out. But it really just went off like a light bulb one day. And I was like, I need to package this. I have a really unique concept. It it goes over so well. I need to figure out a way to get this in the hands of anybody and everybody that wants it. And And my original thought was to kind of just make the business both. It was going to be events and packaging. And very quickly, the packaging just completely overtook and we don't even do events anymore. Okay, so what is the unique concept? What is unique about it? Is it the flavors? Is it the bombs? What's unique? Is it everything? It's kind of everything, right? When you think of cotton candy traditionally, you think of pink or blue and there's really no flavor associated with it. I made Werther's. I made Werther's cotton candy because my machine, you could put the the Werther's in it and it crunches it up and then it was delicious. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but most people, you know, you can't go to a yeah, pink or blue and get that, right? So the whole concept was to take something that had been lost in this really nostalgic tree and really give it this upgrade of something that kids and adults would want to try, you know, the same and, and make champagne flavored cotton candy and bourbon flavored cotton candy and watermelon, mm. island punch and all of these crazy different flavors. And then also really turn it into an experience. And that's where the event side came in because... When you are making the cotton candy in person, it's pretty magical to watch. And and then we found a way to really package that with our glitter bombs, which is what we're really known for on social media specifically. But it's, again, cotton candy is the base of the company. It has edible glitter inside. You drop it in something clear and bubbly. Cotton candy dissolves. And then beautiful edible glitter floats out, making your drink nice and sparkly. How did you, how did you come up with that formula? Like, what, like, do you go to a scientist? Who makes that? Me. <laughs> and I'm not a scientist, to be clear. Um, I have no background in food and beverage at all, which again- It's was- edible glitter. Edible glitter. Yeah. And and the idea for this came from actually while I was doing events. So I've done the glitter bombs for years and years and years before I even had the packaging. And I was at a charity event and this woman came up to me and she had a glass of champagne in her hand and she wanted a cone of champagne cotton candy. And she looks at me and she goes, well, what would happen if I was to put this cotton candy in this glass of champagne? And I said, 
Well, it would dissolve. It would just melt in the glass. And she goes, oh, that's amazing. Let me try. So I spun her this tiny, it was so cute, this tiny little cone of cotton candy. She dropped it into her champagne and she was just in awe. And mind you, it had no edible glitter in it at this point. It was just... Just the cotton candy. And she loved it. And she went to, I swear to you, every person at this 300 person event and had them in line getting tiny cones of cotton candy to drop in glasses. People were just loving it. I've never seen something catch on like wildfire like that at an event. So I literally went home that night and was like, there is nothing here. I need to play with this. And I took a lot of time to figure out exactly how to you know, make it perfect and make it that magical thing that it is today. And there's been kind of several phases of that. But I used to do glitter bombs live at events. I'd spin them near the bars, drop them in. That's, on yeah, That's amazing. Were you ever like a bartender or no? No. I started this business literally right out of college. I had graduated. Oh I was supposed God. to go to graduate school. So no background in any of that. So are you going to open a store ever? <sighs> that's the ultimate question i think i've learned my lesson in saying never say never <laughs> here, here i am um i don't see us opening like a traditional brick and mortar location the overhead on that is insane the only thing that would make sense to me is if we were to have like our production facility in the back because we'd have to move so much product oh, right to support it i could see something like a cotton candy cafe being really cool and like a pop up and, you know, either like New York or Chicago or L.A., somewhere like that, I think could be really fun where it's almost like a bar that you could come and spin cotton candy and, and have it meet so kind of like that vibe. I took my son to Japan. He's 11. Have you seen the cotton candy concoctions? It's like oh, yeah. this massive thing like this. It's in the shape of like a poop emoji. And it's like every level is a color. Yeah, it's we crazy. Can do that. It's crazy. It's art. It's crazy. It's really art. Yeah. Okay, so let's just talk about the topic, TikTok. You're sitting there one day and you say, I'm just going to, did you have a TikTok account? Let's go back. How many followers do you have on TikTok? Right now we have 1.3 million followers. And so would you consider yourself an influencer or would you consider yourself a business owner? That is a line that we straddle that's crazy and I feel like really unique that not a lot of people can relate to because we absolutely get hit up to do influence collabs right well and it's and it's like paid influencer campaigns under the name of Art of Sucra and I tread so lightly with that because I feel like to be an influencer and to successfully be an influencer you have to build a lot of trust with your audience And I do think that because we are a business and if we were to do some type of collab that didn't fit or just was just kind of like a money grab, it would be really like here I am in my Lululemons. Well, why are you wearing Lululemon if you're? Yeah, exactly. You're like an accidental influencer. Pretty much. And the interesting thing about the business page is that like people don't really know what I look like. Like it's not my face necessarily that's on TikTok, it's really my voice is what I get recognized for more than anything because I voice over the videos. But what we've been able to do is we have partnered with some really large brands like Barbie and American Girl and 818 Tequila, which is Kendall Jenner's brand and and Kate Spade and all of that. We've been able to use our TikTok following to get these partnerships where they're paying for our product and then implementing them. And then we'll say, Hey, also, if your brand's interested, we'll make a video about you as well. Oh. We've partnered with you. So it really gives our... So you're selling them candy and then they value the 1.2 million and this fun, young audience. Exactly. Yep. So you just hit them up on Instagram. It's I mean, a- on TikTok. Instagram, TikTok. Honestly, Emma, who's my right hand here, her entire job, her title is brand director. She does a little bit of everything, but... Her entire job is sending pitch emails. So we'll find brands that we want to work with that specifically may not have a presence on TikTok or is trying to grow on social media and really paint this very detailed picture for them about what a collaboration would look like, what content could look like, how we want to see this debate and how it really is a win-win for them because they're getting a really cool product that matches their brand that they can use in any activation that they want and they're getting the social support not only for their own pages but from our audience as well oh my god if i have to move companies i'm coming to work for you 
please. <laughs> my dream world to get into eat cotton candy and do like business development all day. It smells really good in the studio all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So moving back onto TikTok, what would you say is, you know, the biggest, because I feel like, yes, a lot of brands are still new. There's TikTok shop now. There's all these new things. What's the biggest challenge you think? And what's the one thing that everyone should be doing on TikTok? Because no one, everyone's just kind of like, it's like the Wild West over there. It really is like the Wild West. I think there's a couple of things. One is that if you can step away from the emotional side of posting with social media as much as possible, especially if you're a business owner and especially if you are the founder, that's wait, posting. say it again. Go back. If you can step aside from the emotional part of posting, that is key. Because I did not do that in the beginning. And like you said, it's the Wild Wild West. And if you get your emotional, you know, well-being and mental health tied up in views and posting and comments, it. it's not going to be great. It's, it's going to be very challenging. And the biggest thing for TikTok is that consistency is key. And, and that means posting as much as you possibly can to what you can handle and then just letting it go and not worrying about how many views you're getting. And I know that's super easy to say from somebody that has a larger following, but trust me, it wasn't always that way. And and views are views. That's kind of the beauty of TikTok, right? Even if you get 200 views, one of those people could be an exec at Disney. You don't know. Well, the so I just started doing, and again, I'm so shy. I'm not even attuned like that. I started posting these on my on our Babelbox account, me doing these tip videos. But like, it's like, oh my God, like, you know what I mean? So how do you get past that emotion is such, because I do, I have people calling me saying, I saw a video with you in it and it's people that I worked with in the past. Like maybe, you know, like you don't know who's out there. No. Well, and that's the thing too, that this, this sounds like bogus advice and it sounds like, duh, that's so much easier than done. But being embarrassed is a choice. And that's one thing that I really had to come to the conclusion of because I think I'm I'm much like you. I'm really introverted. I would so much rather be at home on my couch with my dog and book and like talk to no one. Like even my husband, I'm like, I love you, but like I would just like to be alone. Like that that's right. more my vibe. So I understand putting yourself out there, it's a very vulnerable thing to do. But also there there comes a point where it's no longer embarrassing and people then start to look at it as you being successful and then they want to know how you did it. So you have to start out being embarrassed. That's just the way that it is. So if you can actively, you know, somehow psych yourself up to understand that being embarrassed is a choice and that you can see the end goal in this. Some of my first videos are, I mean, genuinely laughable. Like, I can't <laughs> believe I post that. Like, Oh my gosh, you you only get better as you do it more and more and more. And then at one point you start feeling so comfortable and you're like, yeah, look at what I've accomplished. Look at how, look at all these cool things that have come from this. I'm so glad that I didn't give up or get in my own way of feeling emotional or embarrassed about it. That is awesome advice. How many TikToks do you post today? Oof. I, at one point when I was growing the account, I was posting three a day, which is a lot. And it was only possible because I didn't have a product. I like to say that I kind of built my no. backwards because I was doing events and then I had a, about a year of a transition where I was figuring out how to do the packaging, how to do the shipping, how to do all of that. So I was posting before I even had a the learnings like, oh my God, I had a meeting with a vendor today and he didn't show up, like things like that. Exactly. Or even like, Hey, we got this packaging sample in here, size A, here, size B. Which, Which one, one do you like better? And I mean, I took that advice to heart. It, it was it was really genuinely helpful information. And it also allowed people to get so invested and so involved in the brand that they actually really care about what we do which is a beautiful thing as well because it's this sense of built-in community that you can't buy. Money can't buy mm -hmm. that. My head is just racing. Do you have any crazy clients that you could share or you can't share? Like I know some one brand told me like Reese Witherspoon made an order, but they knew her real name. Like I wouldn't know. Is that her not her real name? I wouldn't know that. We did 5,000 Glitter Bombs for Beyonce recently, which was- How do you know? 
anything. Like Beyonce like, wrote you, hi, it's Beyonce. Yeah. Hi, it's Queen Bee. No, no. Um, it it really depends on the brand. Um, we worked through specifically a field house, so like an arena for her concert, and like they told us they were like these are for Beyonce. They're going to her VIP, and we shipped five thousand glitter bombs to them, um, which was crazy. And it's sometimes you know, sometimes you don't know. We're currently working with a client right now that they have a large client and we can guess don't know who it is. is, but we don't know who it is and we're not allowed to know who it is. So there are some things that we just get these like mystery, really large products that it could be anybody. It's wild. That's crazy. Yeah. So what would you think is next for you guys? Like, Is there flavors? Is there new innovations? What's next? So for us, I feel like we're really in the good spot right now because, again, it's been a bootstrapped process from the beginning. So one of the things that you have to do when you're starting a business is you have to baby step it. And for us, that has been in packaging because packaging is so expensive. And the whole kind of idea of the brand is that we have these collections that are going to always and forever be on our website. There are original flavors or the best sellers or the tried and trues. We also do a ton of limited edition and seasonal, and that goes over really well. So we're doing these small drops of these flavors and different glitter colors and all of this. So from an ordering standpoint, when you're doing packaging, that can get really tricky. And I feel like over the past two years, we've spent a lot of money pouring into being able to find the right printers, the right providers, the right, you know, being able to afford the foil boxes that are embossed and everything looks beautiful. So now that we have that ready to go, we're really looking to kind of scale into more of the event space. Like again, with the Beyonce's and the Taylor Swift's, we had the ability to do custom cocktails for all of those concerts at the different arenas and launching into amusement parks and things like that, but then also expanding our wholesale. Um, and I don't mean that necessarily as in a big box way, but with smaller- Custom, you know, like more price. premium. Exactly. Well, I'm going to keep you top of mind. And if there's anyone that you that we know that you see, we know that you want to be introduced to, let me know. Amazing. I because I that. love, I love it's connecting. All about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So my last question, even though I have a thousand more, and I'm sure everyone else does. Well, before I ask you my last question, how can everyone find you? Tell us. Yeah. So everything, we kept it very simple for you. It's just Art of Sucre. It's Art of Sucre .com, at Art of Sucre. You'll find it all there. Perfect. And then my last question, which I always ask, which you are an influencer, so kind of odd, but name an influencer you love to follow, but hate to admit that you do. Oh, man, I feel like that that is so hard because I feel like I'm in this space of like I walk both lines and I'm sure I'm an answer to that. To, to some people. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. The one that my husband always teases me about is makeup by Michaela. I literally love her and her accent is seriously so fun. But he's like, who are you listening to? Like, <laughs> what is happening right now? So she's probably the one that comes to mind for sure. OK, good one. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. We are going to be watching you. I personally am going to be ordering from you. Everyone make an order. It's awesome. And just can't wait to see all the rest of your future success. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Two key takeaways from that episode. Go get some cotton candy from artistsucre.com. And the second, if you are not leveraging TikTok, start now. Go Get the app, start selling on TikTok videos, just start it. I might try myself. Have a great day, everyone.